it is so good to be with you and to be in worship with you. You know, the ancient, since the ancient church, there has been a greeting amongst Christians on this day and other days too. You know that greeting, Christ is risen, and your response is, Christ is risen indeed. We do that three times at the end of the third time, as loud as we can say it, hallelujah. Here we go. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. How wonderful. I invite you to stand as I read the gospel story of this day. You know this story. You've heard this story. Today from John 20, we read. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said, Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb, crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place, where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angel asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She, returned to, she turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. This is God's word for us today, and our response is, thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let me ask you, can you remember a time, can you recall a time when you got together with some friends? It had been a while, years perhaps have passed, and just had a great time remembering past stories and times. Or a little more seriously, can you tell me where you were when you heard the events of September 11th, 2001? Where were you when you heard about, as we grew to know them, the towers? Today is sort of like that in the lives of a of a couple of personalities. Today we're using the presentation of the resurrection found in the Gospel of John. We find the resurrection in all four Gospels. Only one other miracle is in all four Gospels, the feeding of multitudes. Each of the writers, of course, has a different perspective. Today we're taking John's point of view, which means as we take John's point of view, we take John's and Peter's and Mary Magdalene's point of view. Now, we all know the scriptures were not written as they were happening, like a dictation happening. There were no video cameras filming Jesus' every word and every action. And so time passes, and John is inspired by the Holy Spirit to recall what he saw and also what, was in, what he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. Some things he did not see. One of the things that he did not 
personally see, but which was told about in no doubt breathless fullness is what Mary Magdalene saw. Imagine Peter or John and Mary, Peter and John and Mary, I better to say, I don't know what, maybe 20 years later, 30 years later, and they're recalling the events of that day. Oh, I remember that day. As if they were in that very moment all over again. There probably was laughter and recounting and more laughter. And can you imagine everybody looking at Mary and going, You thought he was the gardener? Peter, I've never seen you run so fast. Your little stubby legs were just flying. John, why were you afraid to go into the tomb? I can maybe hear John say something like, I stood within eyesight of the cross. I, I saw it all, and I didn't want to see him again that way. You've been part of times when you and friends get together and relive something that you have mutually been through. It's, it's like you're standing right there, wherever there was. And today, you and I, we get to jump back some 2,000 years, and we were right there. Now, now we might ask ourselves, now where was that? Where, where were we? When was that? Well, you remember just a few days ago, we were all standing at the entrance of Jerusalem, and somehow somebody had found out, not, not that we were coming, but that he was coming to town. And they were excited, and they were ready, and they were waiting for us. And they had put, we put our coats on the colt that we found, and, and he rode it into the city. And before long, there were palms being waved, and people were taking off their outer coats and putting them on the road so that he would walk over the top of them. And prophecy was being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. And quite honestly, we thought we had the world by the throat. Because we knew, we knew Jesus was going to be crowned king right away and we would be named his right-hand men right then, right now. But you know, within a few days, Jesus started to change. His countenance just started to change. It was as if he knew something we didn't know. And yet when we look back, he told us about it over and over and over but somehow we didn't hear it or, or maybe just somehow we didn't want to hear it and there we were that Passover night doing what we had done for really about as long as any of us could ever ever remember there we were that meal going through that ritual that we had done and gone through since childhood and then Jesus started changing things you know, it's okay to change some things, but you don't mess with. You don't change the Passover meal. And yet he did. And suddenly that which we had been a part of for years and years and years, as we were there that time, he started making new teachings. This wasn't just bread and wine. This was his body. This was his blood. He had begun to say some very disturbing things. But, but, but then we went, on, we went on to that Garden of Gethsemane. You know, that had been probably our favorite garden until that day. You know, one of those special getaway places that we would celebrate with Jesus, but not that night. You know, because instead of getting away with Jesus... We all ran away from Jesus, and they came and took him away. And we remember it like yesterday. You know, we made so many promises. We were so brave when it really didn't matter, when it was easy to be brave. You know, because when it didn't matter, but then suddenly it did matter. And the swords were not just words, they were real, steel swords and we took off like rabbits there we were standing some of us close most of us 
pretty safely far away as they did to him what we had heard about happening to people. Most of us had never actually seen that happen, had never seen something so horrible. And there he was. And there we were. I can see Mary sitting there thinking, I know, I know where I was that day, but even more, I know where I was before that day ever came, before I met him. I knew where I was. Everybody knew where I was. Everybody knew what I was. Peter remembers every time a rooster crows where he had been and what he had done and what he had said. Can I just say, it's true in your life too. It's true in our lives that there are those little buttons, those little things that get pushed every once in a while, and suddenly we're there again. We're, we're, you know, whether it's some place that you pass or some song that you hear, or maybe it's one of those books, or maybe it's one of those uh, magazines. Maybe it's one of those conversations, those relationships that as they come back through your mind, you remember, you remember exactly where you were. You remember what you did. And it's almost as though it was, I don't know, yesterday. Usually we're thankful. We're thankful for the gift of memory. But you know, sometimes we would give anything for just a well-placed boom, knock on the side of the head for at least some selective amnesia. And then we keep, they just keep talking and they keep talking and they ask each other, but where are we today? Because today we're standing in front of an empty tomb. Today we're standing in front of a miracle and they don't really know what to do with it. Mary, sure, I, I confused him for the gardener. I had no idea what to expect he would look like after those days in the tomb. I just wanted to hold on to him. I just wanted to cling to him. I didn't want to let that happen ever again. It really was unbelievable. Peter and John, they, they remembered him using words like, you know, this phrase that he kept coming up with, you know, raised from the dead. You know, it was one thing when he raised someone from the dead, but who was going to do it to him? We'd all been there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. But Jesus did that when he was plenty alive and he was plenty powerful. You know, after raising that little girl and raising that widow's son in the little community called Nain, we knew he could raise Lazarus. But we saw him die. Who was going to do it for him? And here we are, we stand in the mouth of a tomb and God has interrupted the natural course of events in human history. Because naturally speaking, when you die, you die. You just die. When your heart stops, that's it, and your history is over. But God interrupted that natural course of events. And they were standing there, just trying to take it in. 2,000 years plus has made this story so much easier to swallow for those of us who believe. Today I want us to go back, and I want us to stand right there. I want us to go back to the day Jesus saved you. Back to the day you realized you did believe Jesus was your Savior, and, and suddenly he interrupted your history. You, what you were, you no longer were. Uh, the direction you were going, you no longer kept going that way, but you turned and started in a different direction. You realize that where you were going had no future. You can say, when I gave my life to Jesus is when my life really began. Mary Magdalene, she's still trying to grasp what's going on. She confuses Jesus with a gardener, and then not until Jesus speaks her name does she recognize him, and suddenly she knows. Once again, we find Jesus coming to where she is, and Jesus calls her by name. Can I just say, God still does that. 
Moses is in front of a burning bush and God calls him out by name. Saul is on a dusty road to a town called Damascus and Jesus just calls him out by name. Many of you can remember a time, remember a place when, I don't know, maybe it was an evangelist at an evangelistic campaign or maybe it was a camp counselor at Camp Lucan or Camp Aldersgate. Maybe it was through someone's testimony that you heard or, or maybe it was just through reading the Bible. You knew God was talking to you. God was putting his hand on your shoulder. And some of you would say, some of your testimonies would even include, and he called my name, and then I heard him call my name. Most of us would probably say, I could no longer escape the fact that God's hand was on me. Suddenly Mary, when she hears her name, knows who he is, knows where she is, and her story has changed forever. Can I just say, your story can be changed if you are willing to hear God call your name. So let me ask, what are you doing here today? Because today we are standing in a most sacred place. And not one of us, let me say that again, not one of us deserves to be here. Standing in a garden in front of an empty tomb. And if you listen, you can hear an angel ask the question, what are you doing here? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? This tomb is no longer home to a funeral. This tomb is home to a party. This tomb is home to where life begins. You know, as a pastor, I've been to lots of funerals, lots of funerals. But I've also been to several where I was not the preacher, but I was a friend or family members. Can I just say, today is the day to go back and remember that we do not mourn as those without hope. Today we are remembering what we were and what God has done in our lives. Today is a day to rejoice. It is a day to rejoice in all that God has done for us. Death has been conquered. Death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? I know this may not be an easy picture for some, but if ever there was a time to picture God laughing, today's the day. Today's the day. I mean, I can just see God looking over at Jesus, looking over at the Holy Spirit, and just kind of chuckling and going, Satan thought he was going to tie him down with a tomb? <laughs> My sentiments exactly. <laughs> what does Easter mean for us? It means life. It means that there is more to life than what we see. There is more to life than what you can reach out and touch just today. And there is an eternal nature to who we are and to what we are. The resurrection shouts, welcome to eternity. Let's all do that together. Let's say that line together. And when you hear the word shout, let's do it. The resurrection shouts, welcome to eternity. Step inside the tomb. Find that it is empty. Step inside life and find that you are no longer chained to death. Let me stop for a second. And I want to quickly say, the resurrection does not take sorrow away. I wish it did. You know, when we lose a loved one, we do feel the sorrow of that. The empty tomb doesn't take away our sorrow. It does not take away that unexpected surprise, accident, unexpected death in the family but it does take away hopelessness we do not mourn as those without hope let me again just say you were there the empty tomb was for you today is not just about asking where were you today is about asking where are you what are you doing here but also where do you go from here You know as well as I do, Easter Sunday, it's just one day on the calendar. But it is so, so much more than that. I remember reading the account from a famous missionary evangelist of about 100 years ago. His name was E. Stanley Jones. 
used to tell the story of a young African who became a Christian. And upon accepting Christ, as was a common practice in that culture, when there was a major life change, you would change your name. And so he walks into church after he's accepted Christ, and he announces to everyone, my name is now after. My name is after. Because after Jesus did what he did in my life, my life was forever changed. And he also knew by introducing himself as after, he would always have an opportunity to witness. Hmm. I'm not necessarily promoting that we all rush down to the courthouse and change our names. But today, what are you doing with what happened today? Where, Where do you go from here? Jesus told Mary, don't just stand here holding on to me. Go and tell my brothers, tell your brothers, your sisters. Can I take that literally? Sure. Before the day is over, get on the phone, call your family. Do I take it maybe more figuratively? Sure, be ready to share in the different ministries that are reaching out in the community through this church. Do I I take it evangelistically? Always be ready to tell the good news that Jesus is alive. All of us remember from our history, some of you will remember exactly where you were the moment you heard as though it was mm, yesterday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central Time on a certain November 22nd. President John F. Kennedy has just been shot. Someone did a survey across a broad spectrum of America shortly after that and found out that within one hour, 2.30 p.m. Central Time, nine out of ten Americans knew that the president had been shot. In one hour. That is long before fiber optics. That's long before we all had a cell phone in our pockets. But within one hour, nine out of ten Americans knew that President Kennedy had been shot. 42% knew within 15 minutes. Estimated that within a half hour, over 70% of Americans knew that it happened. The surveyor guesstimated that within three hours, every American knew or had heard. And within three, five hours, most of Europe had heard. I ask myself when I read things like that. How can it be with all the communication ability that we have, there are still people in Florence and Boone County who do not know, have never heard that Jesus loves them? My fear, it's probably there are way too many of us that just want to kind of stand here at the empty tomb and raise our hands and shout hallelujah and Thank you, Jesus, for all you've done. But Mary was looked at, Jesus looked at Mary and said, Don't cling to me. Go and tell somebody. Go tell. If you're here, and as we've sung, and it's been exciting singing, and, and as we've prayed, and as, as we've heard this very familiar scripture reminding us of the powerful day that this is, if on these last in these last few moments you have heard Jesus calling out your name. I want to invite you. I want to invite you to just let Jesus Christ, who is alive, just come into your life. All you have to do is ask him. And he will enter your life and give you real life. Today could be your opportunity, this hour, to just reach out and grab Jesus. For those of us that have given our lives to Jesus, hear him say, don't cling to me. Go tell somebody. Go live the resurrection. Let your life be the resurrection today. Today we heard Peter and John and Mary's story. But you know, in so many ways, it's our story. It's exactly like our story. Yes, you were there. The empty tomb is for you. And because Jesus is alive, Jesus is right here. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, if you're tapping on someone's heart right now, tapping on someone's shoulder and calling them by name, give them courage to just say, Jesus, come into my life. For those of us that have heard you before, and we hear you saying, go and tell somebody, give us courage, give us a boldness we've never had before. Not because this day is different, but because this day controls every other day of our lives. We love you. We thank you. We give ourselves to you. 
And we pray these things in the matchless, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.